please explain to my sons who are here whether or not dinosaurs and aliens are fact or fiction. <laughs> Dinosaur and alien are fact or fiction. Well, um, Job chapter 41 and Job chapter 40. Job chapter 41, Job chapter 40. Now, dinosaurs represent a real problem because these fellows pull these bones back together and claim there are these huge animals stomping around. And if you go up to the Smithsonian Institute, you'll see one called Brontosaurus. He's up there 17 feet high and 30 feet long. You go around and pat him and look at him. And he's about 90% plaster of Paris and DuPont cement and baling wire and uh, cardboard. I mean, uh, when they put those things together, they reconstruct them after preconceived ideas of their own. And I could get those bones and put them back together and get a man 30 feet high. The Bible said there were giants in the earth in those days. Then one day I went down the Paluxia River bed in Glen Rose, Texas. I'd seen photographs of it in books, so I went there when I had a meeting in Graham, Texas. And went down the Paluxia River bed in Glen Rose, Texas. And here were these prints, these so-called dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period. That's the name of a pearl out there. They just make that junk up. That's the chalky cliffs of Dover, a bunch of junk. And I'm and here are these dinosaur prints going down here, and then with these dinosaur prints are some men's prints in the same strata. And the men's footprints are about nineteen inches long and nine inches wide. Big man chasing the dinosaur. Or the dinosaur chasing him, I don't know which. <laughs> and of course they had the dinosaurs all back there millions of years for the man until Leaky went to Africa. And then Leakey went to Africa and got digging around there, the Africans, and suddenly set the date back two million years further, so they were contemporary of the dinosaurs, and screwed up the whole chart. And all these kids had been going to college to study biology and anthropology and zoology and paleontology all these years, suddenly discovered their whole timetable had been all screwed up, and they were two million years off, and had been for 80 years. And when these evolutions were put in the carpet about it, they said, why, if what Leakey found is true, it overthrows all our calculations about Neanderthal man and Piltdown man, Heidelberg man, and we have nothing to offer in its place. Thank you, you stupid nut. Thank you for taking my money and tuition, $8,000 a year, and giving me a dead horse. And so the idea is these dinosaurs live back here. Now, first I'm going to say this before reading the text. I don't believe in them. I don't believe in Pterodactyl or Diplodocus or Stegosaurus or Triceratops or Brontosaurus or Tyrannosaurus, any of them. In the first place, uh, when you study Latin and Greek, you suddenly realize what they do is make up these names. This dinosaur is terrible lizard, you know. And then they, if they, if the thing is more like a man than an ape, it's a anthropus, anthropus, anthropus from anthropus. But if he's more like a monkey, he's, he's a, a pithecus. He's pithecus instead of anthropus. <laughs> And what they do is they make up these names to put together a little Disneyland chart that shows links that aren't there. Amen. They have the, the monkey monkey, and the monkey ape, and then the ape man, and then the man ape, and then the man. And you get little Greek and Latin words to put in those things, so you invent that string, you see, but the string was never there. And you take those dinosaurs, say, what about these bones in Nebraska? They haven't found any complete skeletons of any size. They found some complete spellings, what they call eggs or baby dinosaurs. Yes, I know, I know, uh-huh. And there are all kinds of things about this thing, about those dinosaurs. So they, they keep, what they, you see, I'm an artist. You draw the pretty pictures, see? And what they do in the National Geographic is they paint these pretty pictures. And the kids look at the pictures. Oh, it must be true. There it is. But the fellow painted it. It isn't a photograph. And it's painted by a reconstruction where they did the reconstruction. I've seen the reconstruction. And it isn't very convincing. Now, if there were dinosaurs around here, they could have been in Genesis 1-1, got drowned out. But I don't believe that. They could have been here before the flood in Genesis uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 and drowned out. But I'm not too sure of that. If they were land animals and mammals, they should have been taken to the ark with the rest of the animals, in which case they'd have got out and come on, but there's, oh, there's so many, you know, 
I've had as much formal education as any neurosurgeon you got in the state of Washington. It just didn't take. <laughs> and I'm one of these fellows who's skeptical of skepticism. When you talk about these things, so many possibilities they haven't considered that I'd just soon play racquetball and forget it. <laughs> they don't even know the question, let alone the answers. For example, as a matter of genetic mutation due to oh, atmospheric bombardment. There's all kinds of things. The atmosphere in this earth before the flood is not the atmosphere in this earth after the flood. Right. Something could have survived then that can't survive now. A different kind of a thing. You've had three conditions. Genesis 1-1, one, one, that's one atmosphere. Then you have a different one in Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then a different one in chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. can affect the genes. Right now they're trying to make you think all the dinosaurs were suddenly wiped out with atomic bombardment or nuclear bombardment. Or they, they, they alter their theories every time they get caught. It's kind of like a, a guy that's, uh, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like, Dr. Ruckman, there is no Greek manuscript evidence for 1 John chapter 5, 7 and 8. It doesn't belong in your Bible. There's no Greek manuscript evidence for it. Oh, Professor, I found a manuscript. Here it is. Oh, well, yeah, there's one, but there's only one. Hey, Professor, I found two of them. Well, yeah, there's two of them, but they're late. <laughs> hey, Professor, I found some quotations here from Latin that are early. Well, yes, yes, but nothing before the 6th century. Hey, Prof, <laughs> I just found two church fathers in the 4th century that quoted it. Yeah, hey, man, quit lying to me, you dirty, godless, fraudulent, embezzling, mafia reprobate. Shut your big lying mouth. And that's how these fellows about, about by evolution know. Well, the dinosaurs, they were there. Well, they were there, but they died out gradually. No, they were there, but they died out suddenly. No, they were down, but the slime pits got them. No, it wasn't the slime pits of atomic bombardment. No, it wasn't the time. Shut your mouth, stupid. You know, what you talking about? They're just going round, round, round. And these fellows talk about scientific evidence, scientific fact. So if science should be a body of knowledge that's demonstrable by evidence, that phenomena that can be observed and noted. Right. Nobody's ever, nobody's ever uh, demonstrated creation. They say the schools, you know, the theory of evolution. That isn't a theory. That's a religion. Amen. That isn't even that isn't even a good guess. Well, as well, this mud pie out here and this little itty bitty pool with the itty bitty fishes and the algae in it, and down here this one cell animal skipped fifteen cells, <laughs> turned to something else, a paramecium or a planaria or something, a hydra, and then got into this and came up out, and here you are. And those rats will get kind of demonstrated, and they get these amino acids and polypeptide chains and DNA and RNA and ribosomes and chromosomes and viable, all this junk you pay money to go to school to learn and mix up in this thing, try to hit it with light to make something come out of it. Listen, if they produce life, you know what that would prove? That would prove Genesis 1-1. Because if they ever created life, it'd prove you had to have a creator to create it. The guy's working on it. If they ever made life in a test tube, that would prove conclusively the King James Bible is right, and the whole college curriculum ought to go out the window. Because if you create life, you prove that a creator has to intelligently manipulate the elements in order to produce the stuff. And once you've done that, you've disproved the whole college curriculum. So I'm not much on dinosaurs. I don't think they ever hear. And if I was asked for a supernatural explanation of them, uh, from a Bible standpoint, I'd have a wild one. I'd have those sons of God smitten in judgment and turned into animals, which would really be a wild one. <laughs> All right, Job chapter 40. Now, there are two animals in the Bible that look like dinosaurs. Genesis 40, verse 15. Behemoth, uh, 17, moves his tail like a cedar. 18, bones, a strong piece of brass, bone like bars of iron. Verse 23, he drinketh up a river. Pretty big animal. Job 41, the second one is Leviathan, which you can see by verse 2, 3, and 4, and 5 is aquatic. It's a marine animal. It's a reptilian. And uh, scales, verse 15. But he's a kind of a funny dinosaur. Verse 19 and 20, he's breathing fire. <laughs> he's like a dragon. Verse 24, heart like a piece of stone. Verse 26, 27, 28, you can't kill him. 
for weapons. Those are big animals there, and some of the some of the fellows like the Creation Research Society out in California is trying to figure them now as dinosaurs that missed the ark or missed the boat or something or died before they got there. But that won't do. Uh, behemoth, that word means animals, plural. Right. That animal is more than one animal. Amen. That animal is in Revelation 13. A beast came out of the sea like a leopard, had feet like a bear, and mouth like a lion. Right. And that Leviathan there, if you know that about him, that's a fire-breathing dragon in Revelation chapter 12. I got a book out there on the table called The Unknown Bible, a little paperback. And that has a bunch of things in it like that. And one of the things I make fun of the scholars for is not believing in dragons. I'm the only Hebrew and Greek teacher in America that believes in dragons. You really look what a real privilege you have to come to these services. <laughs> That's the greatest book of records. There isn't any Hebrew or Greek scholar in America who believes in dragons. I do. I think there's one. I think in the tribulation there are going to be several. You say, like what? A good old Chinese red fire-breathing dragon, boy. Amen. And I'll tell you, if the Lord opened your eyes right now, you could see him, you'd pass out. Amen. Yeah. I mean, uh, look at the passage you're reading right. Is this passage you're reading right here? Look at verse 9 and 10. If you see him, you'd fall down, you'd pass out. If you saw him. Look at verse 34. That ain't no dinosaur. Right. Look at 33. Martin Luther is the only man I ever read who, who knew who Leviathan was. And Martin Luther says, But still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His strength and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. And we got that thing from verse 33. Verse 33. Martin said it was the devil. And it is. Right. What about those dinosaurs? I don't think they ever lived on this earth. I think the scientists have put back a reconstruction that's uh, after their own imagination. I don't think they're ever there. Now about the aliens, when you get in that, you're getting something a little bit different. And we don't have time to go into all of it now, but turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, get that in one hand. Isaiah chapter 34 in the other. And we'll find what these here UFOs are. Isaiah 34 and Revelation 9. The Bible's a wild book. It is a wild book. Nothing like it on this earth. Isaiah 34, talking about hell. Isaiah 34, 10. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up from generation to generation. Look at verse 9. It is hell. But look at here, verse 7. The unicorns shall come down with them. Who believes in unicorns? That's a horse with a horn in the middle of his head. Verse 13. The thorns shall come up from the palaces, nettles, and brambles, and the fortresses, and shall be a habitation for dragons. Plural. So they've all embraced it and made them jackals and foxes. Yeah. Verse 14, the wild beast of the desert shall meet with the wild beast of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. Satyr? You know what a satyr is? Well, I think it's half goat and half man. S-A-T-Y-R. Half goat and half man. Who believes in that? <laughs> Ruckman. <laughs> Heretic, cult, you know. It's half goat, half man. How could a thing be half goat, half man? I'll show you. Revelation 9. Revelation 9, verse 7. Revelation 9, verse 7. And the shapes, the locusts, were like the horses prepared to battle. And their face were like the face of men. They had hair as the hair of women. And the teeth were like the teeth of lions, ten. And their tails were like scorpions. Well, those are monsters. And those things are real. But those things that look like horses, and they're called locusts, and they have faces like men and hair like women. Amen. You reckon some of them came up ahead of time around Seattle? <laughs> 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 you ever seen around here with a face like a man, hair like a woman? Amen. Oh, I know those things in Revelation 9 are mutations. They're genetic mutations. They're monsters. 
But they don't come down upstairs, they come up from below stairs. Look at verse 11. They come up out of the pit. Charles Manson claimed to be that angel in verse 11. He still does. They'll murder out in jail. Put the cross in his forehead and said he was the angel of the bottomless pit. Well, he's a type, but of course he's not the real thing. Now, getting this stuff together, we'll get all together. Now, here are the UFOs. Where are they coming from? I believe in them. I believe in UFOs. Amen. I think if you don't believe in UFOs, you're mentally sick. Amen. I think by the time, <laughs> I've the time, I've the time five million people have seen them. It's time to quit, you know. I mean, uh, five million people are not all, you know, kooky. And uh, I've seen them. I've seen maybe 30 or 40 of them. I've never seen a flying saucer. But I've sure seen UFOs, no doubt about it. I can tell you where to see them, too. You go out to Texas in the summertime. At Texas at night, the stars are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. You get out there lying your back out there in the backyard and look up for a while, you'll see some things. And I'm used to see the lights go and stop and sit there for 10 minutes. And then, Amen. they don't go like this. I know how a satellite goes. I've been up in the air. Listen, I've been up in the air long enough to see go with sore feet. And when I get up, when I get on a plane, I've been on planes longer than the pilot has been living. <laughs> and and because of that I know I know what a red and green blinking light is. I know when a light goes over and horizon to horizon in ten seconds don't make a sound. I know that ain't a helicopter, I can figure that out. And you take uh, you take in uh, planes, this something you don't hear about. This awful lot you don't hear about. But I began flying planes in nineteen forty four. So that put me on now for something like uh, 43 years in those things. And let me tell you something. Up till 1968, when you got in the plane, you never fastened your seatbelt unless you were taken off, or unless you were within 500 feet of land on the ground. And all of a sudden, in 1968, they started this. Your captain requests while you're in the cabin to, and remain in your seat to keep your seatbelt fast and feel free to move about the cabin. But when you're sitting in your seat, please keep your seatbelt fastened for your safety and convenience. Thank you. Ah, baloney. What are you talking about? Who are you trying to kid? In your seat, keep your seatbelt fastened for your convenience. Yeah. <laughs> for your safety. This plane is flying at 32,000 feet in a jet stream and it's moving on a Greyhound bus on a new blacktop road. And for your safety? <laughs> don't kid me, man. I flew those planes all through that. You know what happened in 68? About four of those commercial planes had a run in with a UFO and they had to flip switch and pull back and threw people all over the cabin. Yeah. And they don't want anybody to sue them. So they say, when you're seat, keep your seatbelt fastened. At 32,000 feet with visibility for 70 miles. <laughs> and then they say, UFOs are imagination. <laughs> Tell that to the pilot, brother. Yeah. Tell it to the insurance company. So I believe in them. All right, the question is, what's on them? These aliens. I have at home, I probably have the most extensive library in UFO literature anybody in probably in America. I've got all the stuff on them. At least 47 works. And all, and all, what, some say they're little gray men. Some say they're little green men. Some say they're black. Some say they're gray. Some say they have rubbery body scales. Some of them say they're tall. Some of them say they're short. One of them said they talk guttural like Germans, you know. That'd be something out of UFO, UFO go by you. Vigata singing. <laughs> And then some of them say they have ears and mouth but no eyes. Some say they have eyes and nose but no mouth. Parker and Hickson down in Pascoola, Mississippi, about 90 miles from where I live, out in a fishing pier, and one of them landed and took them on board and took blood samples off and sent them back. And those fellows took a lie detector test, and they weren't lying. Amen. They weren't lying. And one guy's watch went bad, ever, and after that he couldn't run, you couldn't run, he couldn't, a wristwatch couldn't run on his hand after he'd been on that thing. And when he saw, when he, when he saw him, he drew a picture of what he saw, that insignia up here. You know what the insignia was? The H-E-W. <laughs> it was the pole with a winged serpent around it. What you have in the medical corps in the Army, Navy, and Marines. The flying serpent. Snake. Now the question comes up, are they from upstairs, downstairs, or in the middle? There are only three explanations. Those things are either aliens from outer space, in which case the modern humanistic approach is they've come to help us. 
<laughs> and they've come down here to show us the way to live and prevent us from blowing ourselves to kingdom come so we can grow up and be like them. I don't care if I'd be like them or not. If I had to stop at a power plant and refuel every time I came down there, I don't know about that stuff. Suck up water and all that kind of business. And come down him upstairs, or else there's somebody down here playing rocket. And with somebody down playing here rocket, it's the Germans. Has to be. I don't know where they are. One old boy I got, I got all kinds of stuff. I got the wildest collection of stuff you've ever seen in your life. If I printed the bullet and what people sent me, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I've got it. They've got Hitler down at the South Pole. He's been down at the South Pole for 40 years, you know, sending UFOs around. Oh, yeah, man. And Peter Beter, he had a war on the moon three years ago between the Australian and the Russian, and the Russians won. And he's got all the line man and the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes all and the Columbia River all laid out so they'll be detonated at one time by satellites. Great stuff, man. I mean, people send me that stuff for me to publish it, you know. Uh, why, why? why uh, Kennedy wasn't killed, that was his double, they cloned him, you know, and oh yeah, Carter was a clone, and uh, Carter didn't finish administration, his clone finished it, and Jim Jones didn't die in Guyana, they picked him up in a plane, took him to Israel, and dumped him out of a plane over Iran at 22,000 feet, wow stuff, <laughs> so all this stuff is going, the, the thing is, they come down here, I know a guy up in Canton, Ohio, professed to have been on a UFO, and flown from, from, uh, from L.A. to Canton, Ohio. One time a fellow sent me a book on how to build a UFO. And I gave it to an engineer, and he looked it over and said, yes, it can be done, but we don't have this kind of material. He showed me how the thing was a spinning circle inside a spinning circle, so the thing could go at about the speed of light and make a right-hand corner without pitching into the wall. <laughs> because the inside thing would rotate in another direction, where the disc made the shot like that, the inside fellow made a slow turn like this and bending light rays and all that stuff, you know. So it might be somebody messing around down here. The only other explanation is from downstairs. If from downstairs they come up to the bottomless pit in the tribulation, that's for sure. And the second thing is, if they're down there coming up now, where do they come up from? And the answer is, I don't know. But if I was going to guess, I'm guessing now, I'd guess the Bermuda Triangle. I'd guess. Because all the hurricanes that hit Florida all come from the same place. Those hurricanes all begin out there in the Atlantic, east of the Bermuda Triangle, and then come in the triangle, and the movement is like this. And they say it's the cold front, the hot front, the low pressure. The, I'm not too sure about that at all. That's how the saucer goes. It goes like that. And I'll give you one illustration, I'll have to close. Sir, I got, I've got to, got to close, but I'm, brother, I'm not, I haven't got his question yet. <laughs> i got to give you one illustration. I'm going to have to close. Our time's up here. Uh, but up there in Michigan, Don Green was taking me to the airport one time, and he said, Brother Ruckman, he said, I've got a man in my church that I think I want to tell you what he's been through and ask you about it. He said, i got a man in my church that was working as a deep sea diver down off Guantanamo in Cuba. And he said, he came back to my church and said, I never want to go down there again. He got out of the Navy five years for retirement time. And he said, I'm never going to dive again. And I said, why is that? He said, well, and he told me the story. He said, they're down there at the bottom of the Muta Triangle, photographing these steps underwater and stuff. You've probably seen pictures of them. And he said, the last time he was down there, and he went down two times and then quit, last time he was down there, he heard voices, and it was people screaming. And he said, they're like they're being tortured. And he said, I thought I was getting the bends or, you know, passing out or tripping because of the pressure and the stuff. That's why I went down twice. But he said, the second time I heard the same thing. And he said, there's something under there. And he said, it was like people screaming they're being tortured. And he said, I'm not going to go down and lose my mind and go back there again. I'm leaving. He got up and came in and got out of the service and left. Went back to Michigan. Now, in close, what I'm going to say is this. When you've been talking about aliens... Your children, you know what they're being conditioned to do right now on TV and have been conditioned for 20 years? They're being conditioned to accept something that's ugly and revolting as cute. Amen. The idea is to get that kid to think that something is twisted and perverted and gruesome and ugly is beautiful or friendly or cute. That's the Q-T-E-T-I-P or whatever his name is and the little grommets and the little feebles and weebles and the Munster family, 
and all the little happy little monsters you buy at the store, they're conditioning the young people to accept something as horrible and ugly as normal. That's right. And of course, the homosexuals come right in with it. That's, That's right. part, of the, part of the sales pitch. And that means that there could be aliens, and if there are aliens, well, the science fiction probably has a pretty good guess on what they are, but if they are what the Bible says they are, they're genetic mutations. They are not superhuman or humanoid, they are combinations of animal and man. Since some of them grunt, some of them growl, and the movements are animal-like. If that's true, I know that's true or not, if that's true, you have genetic mutations. If you have genetic mutations, somebody has been messing with animals. And back in Leviticus chapter 20, it says if you find a man or woman messing with an animal, you'd kill them. Right. So in Africa, hand gets fooled around with green monkeys. And he gets fooled around with green monkeys and he gets him a killing disease. Right. The name of that disease is grit. That means gay related immunity deficiency. And once the queers in Frisco found out what was going on, they begged the newspaper reporters, please don't say grid, call it something else. So they went to another college professor who always accessed the words like Triceratops, Mesozoic, Cretaceous, Diplodocus, and got AIDS for it. Now, if those things are genetic mutations from downstairs, it's going to mean one thing. All it can mean is when the sons of God came down this earth in Genesis 6, they messed with the animals. Right. And when that flood took place, some of them got upstairs and got away from the flood, and some of them went downstairs and got away from the flood, and they are still with us. And if that thing seems wild, then I, I want to have you consider two things. Why did God tell David to ham hock and hamstring and cripple all the horses that he caught from the Syrians? Horses aren't sinners. But I know some cases where they hang out with sinners. Now, one more question. Why did God drown all the animals in the flood? Why not just drown the men? The animals are drowned. And finally, why is it that every one of those false religions that has a false god, that false god is represented by an animal? Or, as the college and high school and football teams say, the bulls and the bears and the eagles and the lions and the wildcats and all that. All right, brother, come ahead of time's up here. Nothing like a Bible to clear up the college education.